If you're brand new with us today, uh, can we clap and welcome you one more time? Thank you you're here today. Make sure I get all the clapping out of the way. And I want you to know we have sermon notes. So if you scan this QR code, we have partnered with Uversion. And uh, it's just an honor to do that, to be one of the few churches to have this. And so scan this out. And you can watch, uh, you can um, uh, see our sermon notes as well as take notes inside of that app as well. Make sure you save it. And so once you get this fired up and ready, QR codes up here on the side as well. But guys, I need you, I need you all to get excited like your favorite team just won a Super Bowl or your favorite team. Oh, man, are your, are your favorite team won the Stanley Cup? Come on, somebody. Stanley Cup. I know I'm wearing a Bears jersey, so it's going to be, it's going to be, preaching's going to be extra good today because we know how to persevere, all right? We, we know what it's like to be, you know, persecution and things like that. But also, uh, the Golden Knights are looking for a chaplain. I'm here. I'll help you out. And, um, but I want you to know, in two weeks, I want you all to come. Invite your, invite your mom, your dad, your brother, your sister, your, uh, your kids, your wife, everybody. And uh, in two weeks, everybody, we are turning seven years old as a church. Seven! Seven years old. We're still here! We're still here! And so God's been doing some incredible things. And so seven years old. So March, 20, uh, February, February 25th. Please come out at 9.30 or 11 a.m. We got merch release. We're going to party. We're going to celebrate all that God has done. Uh, but also we're going to look behind and look at all that God has done. It'll be a memorial. But also we're going to look ahead because we believe it's momentum in Jesus' name. And so this is the year of impossible. This is the year uh, for God to do such an incredible work in our church. It's been incredible through 21 days of prayer fasting. Incredible with our worship night uh, every single Sunday. It's been fantastic to see God moving. And so let's go dive right into our message today. If you got your Bibles, you turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 12 real quick. Acts chapter 12. If you don't have a Bible, you can download the YouVersion app on Google Play or the App Store. And we also have Bibles available for free, for available for you to take back. we got paperback versions. I just want to say, church, thank you for your generosity for providing for that. And so Acts chapter 12, and I just love this portion of Scripture. The night before Peter was to be placed on trial, he fell asleep. He was in prison. He was in prison. Uh, he fell asleep. He was fastened be- with two chains between two soldiers. Others stood at the guard at the prison gate. Suddenly, everyone say suddenly. Suddenly, suddenly that's a preaching point right there, but we'll continue. There was a bright light in the cell, and an angel of the Lord stood before Peter. An angel struck him on the side to awaken him up and say, quick, get up. So if you ever wake up your spouse, you're just being like an angel, everybody. And I'm just being used by the Lord. And the chains fell off his wrists. Then the angel told him, get dressed and put on your sandals. Some of you are having a deja vu moment right here, huh? Get dressed, get dressed, put on your sandals. We're going to church. Come on, somebody. And he did. Now put on your coat and follow me. The angel ordered. So Peter left the cell following the angel. But all the time, the entire time, he thought it was a vision. He thought he was in a dreaming or a vision, and he didn't realize it was actually happening. It was actually happening. Then they pass the first and the second guard. I want you to realize this. He's chained between two guards. They're still sleeping. Chains come off. Get dressed. He gets dressed. He goes past the first and then the second guard post. So he's three layers deep into this prison, shackled between two guards. Then he came to an iron gate leading to the city, and this opened up for them all by itself. Man, sometimes we we, we, we love the super, this is supernatural, isn't it? And then it says they passed through and started walking down the street. Then an angel suddenly left him. Thanks a lot, angel, you know. And so Peter didn't know what to do. So he came to his senses. It's really true. The Lord has sent his angel, saved me from Herod and what Jewish leaders had planned to do to me. Then he realized this, and where did he go? He went to the home of Mary, the mother of John, Mark, where many were gathered for prayer. He knocked at the door, at the gate, and a servant girl named Rhoda came and opened it. When she recognized Peter's voice, she never opened the door. She was so overjoyed, instead of opening the door, she ran back inside and said, Peter, is that the door? Have you ever knocked on someone's door and just stood there like an idiot? (laughs) Peter, standing at the door, they said, you're out of your mind, they said. When she insisted, they decided it must be his angel. Meanwhile, Peter continued knocking. When they finally opened the door and they saw him, they were amazed. He motioned for them to quiet down and told them how the Lord had led him out 
of prison. The title of my message today is Possible with Community. Write that down. Possible with Community. Possible with Community. Now, I know it's Small Group Sunday, and I know, you know, pastor's going to preach on small groups, but this just fires me up because it is with community that I'm still standing here today. Can I get an amen? Man, it is with community through every trial or tragedy that we had. It was because of our community, our church community, our small group community. It's friends around us that we're still standing today. I mean, it is with community that even when we were fostering to adopt and the family had cold feet and, and we lost our child, it is with community that we ran to that brought healing, that brought hope, that brought encouragement. It is through community. It is through community at worship night where individuals are praying for my family because of community. My family heard from Jesus because I am so passionate because I believe it is possible with community. It is possible with community. And I believe the enemy knows that. I believe the enemy knows, oh my goodness, I got to keep, I got to get them away from a life-giving community. Matter of fact, if they, if I can't isolate them, that I need to place them in a life-sucking community. And I love our Surgeon General just this last year. He, he made a statement to Surgeon General of the United States. He said, there's an epidemic of loneliness and isolation in the United States. The significant health consequences of loneliness and isolation. We must prioritize building social connection the same way we have prioritized other critical health issues such as tobacco, obesity, substance use disorders. Our relationships are a source of healing and well-being hiding in plain sight. Community is medicine, everybody. And it says this, together we can build a country that's healthier, more resilient, less lonely, and more connected. I don't know if he's a Christ follower, but I like what he's saying. Because I believe the enemy knows if he can get us isolated, if he can get us lonely, we will not be healed, we will not grow, and we will not find the freedom we're looking for. Mother Teresa said loneliness is the leprosy of the modern world. Loneliness is the leprosy of the modern world. You know what leprosy is? You, you, you get so numb, your, your parts just begin to fall off. And she said, loneliness is the leprosy of the modern world. I believe the enemy wants us in our own personal prisons. See how I tied in Peter? That was good, huh? That was good. But here's what's fascinating too, though. In this day and age, and, and I want you to know, uh, I love marketing. I love social media. I love Instagram. Man, I love to check on the baby boomers on Facebook, see how they're doing. Man, I love to see it on TikTok. I, I just, I love social media. I love feeling socially connected to individuals. But I want you to know this is a fantastic quote by Sherry, uh, what is it, Sherry Turkle in her book, Alone Together. And this is what she said, we are lonely but fearful of intimacy. Digital connections may offer the illusion of companionship without the demands of friendship. So this is why social media is addicting. This is why we can sit at home and just scroll, 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 or, or DMs, or talk to individuals, and, and what, what, what not. But it says our network life allows us to hide from each other, even as we are tethered to each other. So you can be connected, but still disconnected. And it says we would rather text than talk. Where are those people at? Huh? Come on, somebody. I'm deaf, so I'm going to text you. When technology in engineers intimacy... Relationships can be reduced to mere connections. Then easy connection becomes redefined as intimacy. Put otherwise, and I love this, cyber intimacies slide into cyber solitude. And so if the enemy wants to put us in prison, what he's going to do is he's going to put us in digital prisons. And have artificial relationships. And have artificial connections. And that's why I want to encourage you today. It is not good for man to be alone. It's not good for a woman to be alone. It's not good for us to be alone. God created community. Now, here's the goal of community. Community is all God's idea. It's not pastor's idea. It's not pastor's idea to fill a room. It is not pastor's idea to have the most small groups in the city. I would rather have more people attend a small group than on Sunday mornings. Because that's what the power of community. I'm going to give me a good amen right there, right? Yeah. But here's the goal of community, and this is God's goal. The goal of community is to worship God together. And to care for one another. 
And so community is, is and if we, as I really begin to study this more, and, and even seven years ago, I would say, get into a group. And, and we're, we're not a church with small groups. We are a church of small groups. But I want you to understand, community is not optional for discipleship according to Jesus because this is the original plan for us to grow. We grow on a Sunday morning. We're growing our word individually, but God loves to see us grow within community. And I'm going to tell you why. But in Acts chapter 12, I think Peter is a great story. Uh, in Acts chapter 12, you say, well, why is Peter in prison? What got him thrown in prison, shackled between two guards in the inner chamber of the prison. If you, if you realize, we just read, he's three posts deep. He's in the, there's the outer prison, the middle prison, then there's the, the, there's the deep, deep prison. What, what am I trying to say? Inner prison, outer, middle, inner. Thank you, Pastor Lindsay. I'm, I'm really working on that. And so he's in the inner prison because he is, he is deemed as dangerous. And so here's what Peter did. Dangerous Peter, Acts chapter 12, verse 1. About that time, King Herod Agrippa began to persecute some believers in the church. And persecution was, was he was killing them. All right? It wasn't bad traffic or rain. Can I get an amen, everybody? But this is what he said. He had the apostle James, John's brother, killed with a sword. When Herod saw how much this pleased the Jewish people, he also arrested Peter. This took place during the Passover celebration. When he imprisoned him, he placed him under the guard of four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring Peter out for public trial after the Passover. That was going to be the following week. While Peter was in prison, the church prayed very earnestly for him. Here's why community is so important in this day and age. Remember, the Bible was written for us, not to us, but for us so we can learn from it in our daily life. And so here's what I love about Peter's community. And what we find in Peter's community, you can find in this community. You can find in a small group. You can find in Avenue Church. And I'm going to talk about all that, how this is a safe place. But number one, his community was praying for him. You know how awesome it is to know there's a group praying for you? You know, yes, we have a prayer team on our Connect card on the back side. You can take notes. But also on the very bottom is a QR code that says, how can we pray for you? If you scan that QR code, a prayer form is going to go to your phone. You can type it all in there. When you, when you get that, our entire prayer team instantly gets that prayer. And they're going to pray with you or for you wherever they're at. But there's power in prayer. I love this. When they pray, they're saying, come on, church, we got to get together. Peter got arrested. He's going to get, he's going to get killed. They're going to persecute him. They're going to kill him right in public square. Let's pray. And as they're praying together, Peter knocks on the door. Little Rhoda hears his voice, runs back in, goes, Peter's here. And they said, you're out of your mind. That's what we're praying for right now, silly girl. But the reason is because they were praying for something. Have you ever had a miracle happen instantly? I almost said me either, right? But in this situation, they were praying, and boom, it happened. I love this quote by William Temple. He said, when I pray, coincidences happen, and when I do not, they don't. <laughs> My goodness, what do we got to lose by praying? But it is, it is awesome when, when, when you don't know what to pray, or, 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 you, or you're, just, you're, just, you're out of prayers, it is awesome to know there's a small group praying for you. Yeah. It's awesome to know there's a community calling down heaven right. just for you. It's a prayer. His community was praying for him. But number two, his community was available. His community was available. I love that the angel broke him out. They did a little jailbreak. I love that when, when, when Peter finally went into the house, I, I wonder if someone turned around and said, okay, we were praying for a miracle, but who prayed for jailbreak? Who did that? Yeah. And somebody was like, I did, yeah. <laughs> like a new Christian, yeah, jailbreak. Let's go. I was praying they would release him, not jailbreak. But when Peter got out of jail or prison, the first thing, his first inclination was he didn't flee, he didn't run. He went to his community. And he went to his community because he knew his community was always available. When he realized this, the angel took off. When he realized this, he went to the home of Mary, the mother of John Mark. He went to the home of Mary, the mother of John Mark. And I love this. I begin to study this out. Mary's house has significance. This is not Mary, the mother of Jesus. This is Mary, the mother of John Mark. This is just another, Mary's a very popular name at this time. But I love this because here's a mama that made her home available. 
She made her home available. And here's what happened when she made her home available. It was known that her house was large enough to host meetings. It was known that her house was possibly the location of Jesus' last supper. This also was the house where it was known that 120 gathered to pray in Pentecost. This was the house. And it was her house because she just said, I'm just Mary. Mary, Jesus' mom? No, Mary, the mother of John Mark. Who's John Mark? I don't know, but my house is available. My community is available. There can be miracles happening in your house. Only because she made it available. She made it available. She made it available. In the middle of the night, Peter broke out. He knew exactly where to go because he knew there was one house available. He knew there was one house like Las Vegas open 24-7. I was going, okay, that was bad. I'm sorry. And I love this because it was a common place that was always available. Friends, is your house available for miracles or is your house closed? And this is hard, man. I'm, I'm a good old Midwest boy. I came to Vegas uh, 18 years ago. And in Vegas, I was like, why are people opening their homes? Why is my neighbor pulling into the driveway, into his garage and shutting the door? You know, like, I was like, hey, neighbor, where are you going? You know, I'm that guy. Because there's an epidemic of loneliness and isolation. And enemy knows. Enemy knows. I love this, though. I want you to, I'm going to take a kind of a step further, though. His community was always available. But relationship is a two-way street. And so his community was available, or I should say his community is available if you make yourself accessible. You cannot close up your door. You cannot put your walls up and then say, where's the available community at? Where are you at? You, you haven't been there for me. You know, Pastor Lindsay and I were, were lead pastors of the church. And, and when we went through some trials and tribulations, we had to let people know. There was a temptation to say, nope, we got to be the pastors. Nope, we got to be, is everything's perfect. But when you go through the adoption, when you go through these kind of things, we found, we, found, we found how life-giving it was, right? I mean, even before I would come on the stage, people go, let me pray with you. Yeah. I said, please, please. And it's because of community, but it's also because we made ourselves accessible. Right. We were transparent. I'll tell you what, if you join a small group this week and you get in, you get to determine how deep your group goes yeah. by how accessible you make yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And that's hard, isn't it? Trust me, I once went to a group, uh, church many years ago, and it was a Sunday school, so it wasn't a small group. And then the Sunday school, they were like, tell us your deepest, darkest, like, like weakness. And I was like, I'd rather not. <laughs> I don't know anybody here. I'm only here today, you know what I mean? <laughs> so I understand that. There's wisdom in that. But his community prayed for him. His community was available. But also his community was messy. His community was messy. And this is where I can get some of y'all. All right? I'm going to read your mail for just a second because I've been in community and it's always messy. Yeah. It's always messy. And the ones that are clapping, they're a little weird, aren't they? Yeah. Ah, you know. I want you to see this. When she recognized Peter's voice. So now we get a look in their small group. They're praying. One of our, one of our small group members is in prison. Let's pray. So they all got together and they prayed. That's just like when someone goes to the hospital. I've seen small groups go to the ER and to the uh, meeting room, and they're just in the waiting room, and they're just praying. They're just like, who are you here for? We're all here for so-and-so. I've seen that many times, and that's powerful. But here's her small group. She recognized Peter's voice. She was so overjoyed. Instead of opening the door, she ran back inside, told everyone, Peter is at the door. God answered her prayers. And they said, you're out of your mind. What's wrong with you? I bet you some people are like, we're praying. How dare you interrupt? And I love this right here. They said, when she assisted, they decided it must be his angel. Here's what's fascinating. They had a theology back then. And the theology was that someone's spirit or someone's angel can freely walk around the city. And that that spirit or angel looked like that person, but it wasn't that person. And so they'd be like, didn't I see you at the marketplace eating during the 21-day Daniel fast? And you'd be like, that was my spirit. Did I, did I see you at Palestine gambling? That was my spirit. That wasn't me. 
<laughs> and so you know what? Community gets messy because of theology, but I also want you to see this. Here's the 12 disciples. And here's, he, these are 12 individuals that Jesus handpicked. Jesus didn't have open enrollment for the 12. He didn't say, anyone want to be my disciple? He walked around and handpicked these 12 individuals. And I want you to see their background. It says Peter and Andrew, they were Jewish fishermen. Also, James and John were also Jewish fishermen. These were brothers and these were brothers. I want you to know if you were a Jewish fisherman, that means you were rejected to be a rabbi. And if you were rejected to be a rabbi, if you didn't make the cut, you had to go work for your father's business. And so they're Jewish fishermen. They're God's chosen people. Remember last week, the Israelites first. Then Matthew was a despised tax collector because he was a Jewish individual who worked, who worked for Rome. And so he was so despised, he couldn't hang out with Jewish people. He had to hang out with other tax collectors. So he was despised. Then Simon the Zealot. A zealot is a political movement against Rome. I want you to understand that Simon the Zealot was called a daggerman. A daggerman would hide in the shadows, and if there's a Roman guard, he'd come up behind the shadows, slice his throat. That was Simon. He's at the table too. I'd be like, Simon, what's your name at, dog? <laughs> we got a little metal detector at the door, Dad, Simon. And then you have Judas who betrayed Jesus. The entire time he's going, Jesus, I can, if I was Jesus, I'd be doing this. If I was Jesus, I'd be, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make some money off of Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. I want you to think about this. The other disciples, it was unknown what they did. Can you imagine their group discussions? Yeah. <laughs> An activist, blue-collar workers, a, a, a tax collector. Can you imagine someone who was betraying everybody? The moment I get a chance. Can you imagine that their community was a little messy? Yeah. It was a little messy. Right. And what happens is we get hurt by the mess. Yeah. We get hurt by community. We get hurt by community. And this is an area I just can't joke about because it happens. Yeah. We, we call it church hurt. We call it people hurt. We call it what they did, what they said how they treated me, because it's messy. There's differences, there's opinions, there's mistakes, there's accidents, there's assumptions, and we get hurt by community. That's exactly what the enemy wants. He wants you to get hurt so that we, go, we, we isolate ourselves. We, 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 he wants us to get hurt so that we never uh, restore the wound in our heart. He wants us to disappear for years and years and years, never making an impact for the kingdom of heaven. But here's what's fascinating. We were hurt by community, but also by God's design, we are healed by community. So we're hurt by community, but we're healed in community. And here's, what, and here's how I know. First John, and I love this, First John chapter 1, if we confess our sins to Jesus, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us. But then James goes, ah, hold up. James chapter 5, if we confess our sins to one another... And pray for each other so that we may be healed. So when I confess my sins to Jesus, I'm going to heaven, and he'll cleanse me, and he'll always forgive me. He will always forgive you. Always forgive you. Always will forgive you. But God's design, he decided to use people to heal you. To use people to heal you. And I love uh, Our Lady of Mississippi Abbey. This is a uh, famous nun, and I just love what she said. Uh, and this is what she said. She said, stability is the spiritual skill for staying put to get somewhere. We vow to remain all our life with our local community. We live together. We pray together. We work together. We relax together. We give up the temptation to move from place to place in search of an ideal situation. We have to give up that temptation. Ultimately, there is no escape from oneself. And the idea that things will be better someplace else is usually an illusion. It's usually an illusion. There are levels to community. Level one, when you get into community, these people are awesome. They're like superstars. And then as you get to do life with them, there's a middle, there's a, the second stage is these people are messed up. They're jacked up. 
I'm going to leave this community and find another awesome community. But if you stay with that community, the third stage is this is the real deal. These are my ride or die people. These are my individuals that know my junk and I know their junk and together we're getting better. But also, number three is community. They helped one another. They helped one another. It's a little delayed right there. It helped one another. And we see this next chapter too. This is when the community began after Jesus ascended into heaven. In Acts chapter 2, we all know this. It says, and all the believers met together in one place. They shared everything they had. They sold their property, possessions, shared money with those in need. They worshiped together in the temple, met in homes of the Lord's Supper. So this is church, this is small groups, and this is dinner. Can I get an amen? Yeah. And they shared meals with great joy and generosity. Amen. This is how they physically helped each other, materialistically helped each other. But also, I want you to see this, Peter in Acts chapter 12, he knocked at the door, and they told her, you're out of your mind, and when she insisted, they decided it must be his angel. I said it before, but I need to say it again. They helped in our bad theology. Yeah. And I want you to understand this. I want to go back to this, because I missed something very important. They helped in bad theology. Sometimes it's whoever who gets you first. Or it's even, it's, it's, it's whatever they told you first. And I love it in a small group, whether it's rooted or whether it's just a normal small group. As we begin to share, I love how people go, that's a great question. I love it when someone, I have, there's a 26-year-old in our church, he has now texted me questions. And can I just tell you, there's no question that's too stupid or too dumb. Because when you ask questions, that's how you learn. Yes. And I love that. I love that people can go, I mean, you can literally go, who died on the cross? And you're like, Jesus, stupid. No, you'd be like, Jesus Christ, can I tell you what happened? Can I tell you why? Because there's no such thing as a dumb question. There's no such thing as a stupid question. Man, I, that, that is part of discipleship. But here's a, another way that, that community helps us. It exposes and it encourages. It exposes and it encourages. It's just like if you got some issues and you get married... Your issues, don't, your issues don't magically disappear. Right. Your issues get magnified. Your issues get magnified. And we can go, no, I'm never getting married. You know what I mean? I'm never going to a small group. But you understand, it's that in that magnification that we begin to find hope and we begin to find healing. Yeah. It exposes us, but also encourages us. Matthew chapter 7, sometimes we jump on this. Don't judge others and you will not be judged you be treated as you treat others. The standard you use in judging is the standard by which you will be judged. A lot of times we use this and go, don't judge me. Now, if you're saying that, it's because you're hiding something. But I love it. the original word for judge in this original context, Matthew chapter 7, the original language. Judge means to look at someone and to inspect them or to interrogate them. But when it says don't judge others, Right? Or you will not be, don't judge others and you will not be judged. The reason why he is saying that in the context of pointing out something in their life and excusing the sin in your life. What about you? What about me? What about you? And I love this because Jesus said the standard you use in judging is the standard by which you will be judged. In the context of community, and this is what Jesus was talking about, he wasn't using the golden rule. He wasn't saying treat others how you want to be treated. What he was saying was if you are transparent in community, they're going to be transparent in your life. They'll help you see the log in your eye as you point out the speck in their eye. What is that? It's iron sharpens iron. How do I know that? Because Jesus said you'll know them by their fruit. And I pray to God that if I have bad fruit in my life, I pray I have people brave enough to tell me about it. That people are brave enough to say, Pastor, I have a lot of people in my life that don't call me pastors. They say, Jeremy, bro, I've seen this in your life. I've seen a little bit of ego. I see a little bit of this, a little bit of that. And, and, and I have a choice to make. Do I either pick up that bad fruit and cut it off? Or I just say, don't judge me, bro. And so here's your challenge today. I challenge you today. Will you join a community? and experience the impossible in your life and in others. In your life and in others. You know, I even remember it was 
you know, during a hard, difficult season as a family. And if you're brand new to our church, I want you to know, um, I want you to know I, I, I have two sons now. He's back. And we have a, a court date in May. Come on, somebody. But I want you to know during that season, I remember Pastor Lindsay said, we got we to gotta do a small group. And we do a small group every semester, every season. We love our, we love our small group. And this time, <laughs> and this time we, we decided to do Rooted. And I remember, okay, let's do Rooted. Okay, let's do this thing. I'm the, I mean, I've been in ministry for 21 years. Let's do Rooted. And I'm so grateful that I did. Because yeah. it was in my community, and I often say this every single week, as we're leading, as we're hosting, as we're going through the curriculum, as we're learning ourselves. I, I, I remember every single week I'll say this. Is this, this is my small group too, right? I'm not just a facilitator or just a pastor. Right. I'm someone who's in this group. I need to share. I, I, I need to hurt. I need to cry. I need to, you know, uh, I need to share my emotions. I, 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 need to, I need to let some things out. And I'm so grateful for my community and my small group. Because really, community ushers in the impossible. It's like Moses. His arms got tired. His Israelites were fighting. And he had two individuals to hold his, hand, hold his arms up. Yeah, yeah. Man, we have people in our lives that hold our arms up. Yeah. Make friends, you are not that impressive by yourself. Yeah. Yeah. It's with your community that makes you better. But it's with your community we begin to see the impossible. They told Rhoda, Rhoda, you're out of your mind. Yeah. It must be his angel. Meanwhile, Peter continued knocking. <laughs> Can you imagine that? Peter's like, ah! <laughs> They've got to know by now. The streets are flooded with soldiers. Ah! When they finally opened, that's why Peter's always mad. <laughs> when they finally opened the door and they saw him, they were amazed. This word bothered me all week. Just amazed. I mean, God answered their prayers. I bet you there's one person in that house that could fit 120 people. At least one person in that house went, really? <laughs> Magic dust. You know what I mean? Like, wow. But they were amazed. That word amazed in the original language. Anytime something bothers me, I want to look it up. And that word amazed comes from the original word existemi. I looked it up on YouTube, so I know it's existemi. <laughs> and it means to be astonished, to be greatly amazed, but it means beside themselves. They were beside themselves. They were like, what? Are you serious? Some were going, this works? Think about their perspective. Their friend just got killed by the sword. Peter's about to get killed. And they said, he, he broke you out? How? An angel? Peter. They were amazed. They were beside themselves. Sometimes you just need to link arms with people and just watch God do the amazing. Watch God do the incredible. Sometimes you come on a Sunday morning, you're beside yourself. I mean, I've talked to people after the service, they just go, I don't even know what happened, but it was amazing. It was existemi. They were beside themselves. And that same word is found in three other places in the Bible. It's found in Acts chapter 2. It's on the Pentecost. They're all... Mary's house, mother of John Mark. They're praying together. They were all meeting together in one place. Suddenly there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm. It filled the house where they were sitting. I like that prayer meeting where you're sitting. Can I get an amen, everybody? <laughs> then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each one of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit. Been speaking in other languages. And the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. At that time, there were devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem because they were there for the festival. They were there for the Super Bowl. Ah. And when they heard the loud noise, everyone came running. Was that gunshots? Nah, that wasn't gunshots. And they were bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken by the believers. Now, I want you to see this. And they were completely amazed. How can this be? 
these people. These people are from Southwest Las Vegas. These people, ho oh, ho, they're from Lordtown. These people are from the east side. These people are from the east side. These people are from Henderson. <laughs> These people are from Prump, you know, like. Overton, you know, like. And yet we hear them speaking in our own native languages. Friends, community is God's design to disciple us, but also to amaze the world. It is amazing when we get into the community. Will you stay with me, please? I want to pray with you today. And here's our, my goal today. My goal today is to be obedient to the Holy Spirit. And my other goal is for you to, to join a small group. I want you to join a small group. And I know it's going to be tough. I know it's going to be difficult. I know for some, it's going to be deja vu. It's going to be PTSD. I know for some, it's going to be extremely difficult. For some, it's going to be awesome. I'm always fascinated by my parents. They retired. And they moved from one city to another city. And my, my stepdad uh, transferred jobs, had a new position in another city, three hours away. And I remember asking them, how's it going in your new city? It's like, great. You found a great church? Your mom's serving in the nursery? I'm ushering? I said, already? Already? I said, that's great. I mean, that's just, I love that. Then he said, well, I got to go. I said, where are you going, Dean? It's uh, 9, 9 p.m. at night. It's 9 o'clock at night. Where are you going? Like, Aren't you a little too old to be going out, Dean? You know. And he goes, I'm going to go with my Bible study. Yeah. We have a Bible study from 9 p.m. to 10.30 p.m. at night. Yeah. Good. Because one of the dads, all of us are retired, but one of the dads, he's a single dad and he has kids. So he's going to put them down to bed and we all go to his house. Yeah. That's just community, friends. Community is available. Yeah. You become accessible. Right. And know it's messy. This is a safe place to grow in community. Will you just bow your heads, close your eyes, I want to pray with you for just a moment. But maybe the Holy Spirit grabbed your heart today. And you pulled you into this building today. Maybe you're saying, Pastor, I've been isolated and I've been lonely. Because friends, you can go into any, any, you can go into any gathering, movie theater, casino floor, workplace, even a church, and you can still be lonely. You can still be isolated. But do you know what the first step is for Jesus to heal our hearts, to come into our heart? Maybe you're here today and you're saying, Pastor, I'm going to join this small group. I'm, I'm going to do it because I want to grow. I want to be a disciple of Jesus. I know, understand, I always thought small groups was the pastor's idea or the or religion's idea. But now I know it's God's idea. But for just a moment, we're going to take a time out. And I want you to give an opportunity to those that say, I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to give him my heart. If that's you today, I want to pray with you. I want to believe for God not just to come into your heart, for him to heal your heart. To heal the mess and the wounds that's deep down on the inside. With every head bowed, if I close, I won't embarrass you, I won't single you out. I just want you to raise a hand and say, Pastor, that's me. I'm going to give my life to Jesus today. That's me. Just raise a hand. One, two, anyone else? Just two hands. I'm so proud of that. I'm just, I love that. Anyone else? Anyone else? Anyone else? Anyone else? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you. Three hands. I saw that. I thank you for every hand that was raised. I thank you for every person that's online. I thank you for what you're doing in our church, in our lives. And Father, I pray for us to find life-giving community. In Jesus' name. With every head bowed, with every voice raised, 
I want everyone to repeat this prayer after me because we don't do life alone. We are a community. I want everyone to say, dear Jesus, say thank you for dying on the cross. Say thank you for paying for my sins. Say forgive me of my sins. Say be Lord of my life. Come on louder. Say the best way I know how. I'm going to live for you because I now know who I am. I'm saved. I'm redeemed.